When people first get diagnosed with diabetes, they usually have two questions running through their minds. One, how did I get this way? In other words, the cause of diabetes. And two, what can I do about it? The cure. If you get the right answers to these two questions, you've got nothing to worry about. And we'll answer those questions today. When it became apparent to me that I was following in my mother's footsteps and heading straight for the land of diabetes, I wanted to know what causes diabetes. Strangely, at that time, the consensus among the experts was there was no consensus. The standard answer was that we just don't know. And some would go so far as to say, well, we don't know for sure the cause of diabetes, but we do know it has nothing to do with eating too much sugar or too many carbs. Well, things have changed a bit since those days. Today, there are essentially three answers to the question, how do diabetics become diabetics? The standard answer given by probably the majority of dietitians and many of the doctors is still, we don't know. And we cannot cure or reverse it, but we can give you some pills and or some insulin to help keep your numbers a bit lower for a while. Well, that's not a very satisfactory answer. Now, there are a number of vegan doctors who are sure they have the answer, and they'll tell you the reason people become diabetic is they eat that nasty, evil meat. Just stop eating meat in all animal products, and diabetes will disappear. But there's a huge problem with that theory. It simply does not hold true. I frequently hear from vegans and vegetarians who are diabetic. They don't eat meat, but they still have raging diabetes. India is filled with vegetarian diabetics, and they're increasing all the time. And if refusing to eat meat does not protect you from diabetes, then eating meat surely cannot be the cause of all diabetes. There are a sizable group of doctors and nutritionists who have come to a different conclusion, and those views are what I'll be sharing today because I thoroughly believe them. And these insights have worked well in my life since 2002 and have kept me from becoming diabetic. In fact, my glucose levels have come down from pre-diabetic years ago to well below pre-diabetic today. Some of these doctors have a large presence on YouTube, these ones that get it right, in my opinion, and they would include Dr. Jason Fung, Dr. Richard Bernstein, Dr. Sten Ekberg, Dr. Eric Westman, Ken Berry, along with many others. Now, I'm not a doctor myself, but what I'm going to share with you in this video is sort of a representation or a summation of most of their views as to, one, what causes diabetes, and two, how can you fix diabetes so that your glucose levels are no longer in the diabetic range? All right, let's get right into the causes of diabetes. In other words, how did I ever get this way? I'm going to give you four different reasons that contribute to making us diabetic, and then I'll share two more foundational underlying causes. And then I'll share the good news, the simple but powerful way to reverse your condition. Now, the first reason for diabetes is body type and genetics. I don't consider this the major reason, but it is unquestionably a factor. There is a way to simply look at a person for a second, just a moment, and determine whether they're a great candidate to become diabetic. Here's how you can tell. If they have slim arms and slim legs and a large belly, they're in trouble. And guess what? That has always been me, as it was in my mother's case. I think I could weigh 250 pounds and I would still have slim arms and slim legs, but I have a monstrous stomach. As a teenager, I was skinny all over, and after forcing myself to ingest all kinds of calories, I gained weight. But I still had skinny arms and skinny legs. But I had grown a humongous belly. Afterwards, I even things out a bit by lifting weights and doing push-ups, but that has always been my body type. 
And the problem is, with a large stomach, chances are you will easily develop a fatty liver and fatty pancreas, and that is bad, bad news. Is there anything you can do about this? Well, yes and no. You can't go back to God and ask for a different body type. But if you stay on the slim side, your stomach is not going to grow too large and that issue will be minimized. Some people grow weight equally on their arms and their legs and all over their body and they can be a little bit overweight and still not have a very large stomach and they won't be so likely to become diabetic. But I could never do that. I have to stay slim or my stomach will grow large and that is a recipe for metabolic disaster. Reason number two for why we become diabetic, fatty liver and fatty pancreas. Whatever your body type, people who are diabetic tend to have a lot of accumulated fat in their liver and in their pancreas. Today, doctors talk about fatty liver disease. The liver and the pancreas are absolutely critical in your metabolic health. And if you have a liver stuffed with fat and a pancreas loaded with fat, there's almost no way you could not be diabetic or at least insulin resistant. Especially when you're in your 40s, 50s, and beyond, you really need your liver and your pancreas to be lean and functioning well to keep diabetes away from your door. Some doctors are beginning to think that what we used to call dead beta cells in the pancreas are really non-functioning beta cells as a result of being engulfed with and choked by too much fat. And often when you can slim down your pancreas and get rid of the fat, some or most of those beta cells may start functioning again. Reason number three of why people become diabetic is too much sugar in your body in your liver, and in every cell of your body. Your cells are loaded with a terrible combination of sugar and fat. When you start to become diabetic and when insulin tries to coax the cells to take glucose from the blood, those cells put up a sign which says, Office Closed. They are so overloaded with sugar and fat, they cannot and will not accept any more sugar. Insulin cannot do its job. The pancreas tries desperately to remedy this situation by producing more and more insulin. But as insulin resistance increases wildly, the glucose in the blood simply cannot get into the cells and your blood glucose levels begin to rise. Your fasting glucose goes from 100 to 150 to 200 to 300 to 400 and more. Your doctor tells you you are diabetic and gives you a prescription for pills or insulin, and you wonder how you got this way. A fourth reason for diabetes is obesity. Now, there's not a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between diabetes and obe obesity. Some obese people do not have diabetic numbers, and some thin people are diabetic. So I'm not suggesting that the moment you become significantly overweight, you're going to have sky-high blood sugar. Still, there is no question that there's a link between being overweight and diabetic. And often, if an obese person loses enough weight and gets down to a normal weight, they will cease being a diabetic, at least according to their numbers. Their A1C comes down, their fasting glucose levels come down, and their doctor pats them on the back and says, well done. Now, these first four reasons are true and reasonable, and in my mind, beyond dispute, but they don't tell the whole story. There are deeper and more foundational reasons behind them. In fact, there's really just one reason for diabetes, and that springs from two behaviors and gives fuel and energy to those first four causes. Let me explain. Let's say you're walking in the woods and you see a dead deer. He has an arrow which has pierced his heart. If someone were to ask you, how did that deer die? What killed it? You might reply that the arrow killed the deer. The arrow pierced his heart and put an end to his life. And you'd be right. But just saying the arrow killed the deer doesn't tell the whole story. You could back up a bit to the origins of that deadly shot and say it was the bow that killed the deer. The arrow didn't get into the deer on its own. It flew from a bow. So it was definitely the bow that killed the deer. Right again. <laughs> the bow definitely played a role in the death of that deer. But still, that doesn't tell the whole story, because behind both the arrow and the bow, there was a hunter who fitted an arrow to his bow, pulled the string back, and let the arrow fly. 
In truth, it was not so much the arrow, not really the bow, it was the hunter who killed that deer. The hunter was the deeper cause. Without the hunter, neither the arrow nor the bow could have done the job. Now that is precisely how it is when you look at the causes of diabetes. You can talk about fatty liver and fatty pancreas. You can talk about cells being stuffed with sugar and fat. You can talk about obesity. But behind all of these, there is a deeper and a more profound cause. It is one cause, but it's activated by two different activities that we've been engaging in for years and decades. Now, what is that cause? It is something known as hyperinsulinemia, a condition where high levels of insulin constantly float through our bloodstream creating fatty liver and fatty pancreas, producing obesity and stuffing our body's cells with sugar until they can hold no more. Dr. Sten Ekberg says the cause of insulin resistance is insulin. Type 2 diabetes is the full-blown manifestation of insulin resistance. Dr. Jason Fung writes excessive insulin drives ectopic fat production and organ infiltration. The underlying cause of the entire cascade of type 2 diabetes is hyperinsulinemia. And Dr. Benjamin Bickman writes, Because insulin causes insulin resistance, insulin injections are increasing the person's insulin resistance, which over time creates a demand for higher insulin doses. So the ultimate cause of diabetes is radically high levels of insulin. Levels which we were never meant to endure. Levels which become toxic and poisonous and which lead to health disasters of all kinds and not just diabetes. As I mentioned, behind these high levels of insulin are two activities that create the high insulin. The first is a lifestyle of constant grazing. Never in the history of our earth have men and women grazed on food the way we do today. We stuff chips into our mouths as a pre-breakfast treat, and then we eat our breakfast, and then a mid-morning snack of some kind, and then lunch, and then a mid-afternoon snack, and then supper, and then an evening snack shortly before going to bed. Then we wake up the next morning and reach for, you guessed it, another snack. Like the cows, we graze all day long. We go to an office meeting, and snacks are provided. We attend a Bible study and snacks are available. We go to a PTA meeting and everybody heads for the snack table after the meeting. Our mantra has become eat and snack, eat and snack, eat and snack. Day after day, week after week, and year after year. What this means is that we never give our blood sugar the opportunity to return to its baseline level. Just as it starts to go down, we stuff ourselves with another snack and send it right back up again. And after a while, our baseline level rises, and then it rises some more. And with all this eating, we keep our insulin at artificially inflated levels as well. Finally, we start having strange symptoms. We go to the doctor, and he or she tells us we have an A1C of 8 or 10 or 12 or 15 and we know that we're in trouble. The second foundational cause of diabetes is once again high insulin levels, but as a result of eating a diet with far too many carbohydrates. As much as some of the plant-based gurus love to scream at us that carbs are fine and our problem is really meat, the truth is that meat barely raises blood sugar and provokes little insulin release. Fat does not raise blood sugar at all and provokes virtually no insulin release, but carbohydrates raise blood sugar like crazy, and they provoke a huge insulin response. And this is a law of nature. Anyone can prove this in a lab or with a $20 glucometer. It's bad enough that we overdose on carbs, but we often are eating the very worst kinds of carbs, processed carbs loaded with sugar using a base of white flour. While we munch on our chips and our cookies and our donuts and snack cakes and pastries, while we eat our baked potatoes and french fries, while we stuff ourselves with mountains of rice and pasta and make breakfast cereal our go-to morning meal, we are forcing our poor, battered, worn-out pancreas to pump out insulin and to pump and pump and pump its little guts out 
in trying to keep up with our outlandish, exorbitant, uncontrolled, irresponsible diet. Meanwhile, the cells throughout our bodies are becoming stuffed to the gills until they finally scream out, no mas, no more. And once they start rejecting the blood sugar, which prodigious amounts of insulin keep gamely trying to force into them, our glucose levels go through the roof. And when we test our blood sugar, it reads 200, 300, 400, or sometimes that number is so high it will only read HI high. Involved in this process is probably obesity, fatty pancreas, and fatty liver. But behind the scenes, that monster lurking in the shadows is outrageously high levels of insulin, which is the bull in the china shop, creating untold damage while we eat our chips and drink our sodas and watch our favorite TV shows. Suppose a man went to his doctor and said, Doc, my last A1C was at 6.0, which is pre-diabetic. But I don't want to be pre-diabetic. Anything I do, I want to do it all the way. I want to be fully diabetic, not pre-diabetic. I want real diabetes. Can you help me? Well, if that doctor knew very much, he could easily help the man obtain his goal. All he'd have to do would be to give him this advice. Go to the store and buy all kinds of chips, cookies, candy, and snacks. Keep some right beside your bed so you can eat them in the evening and in the morning. In fact, the minute you wake up in the morning, eat a bag full of chips and a candy bar. At breakfast, eat a mountain of pancakes drenched with sugary syrup. In mid-morning, eat a fruit pie and down it with a big glass of orange juice. For lunch, have a baked potato, two bananas, two slices of bread, and drink a supersized Coke. Have a full bag of corn chips in the afternoon as a snack. For supper, eat a big plate of spaghetti with half a loaf of French bread and eat a large piece of pie with ice cream on the top. And just before you go to bed, eat a huge bowl of sugar-frosted flakes cereal. Do this every day for the next four months and then come back and see me. We'll give you an A1C test and I guarantee you that you'll test at the fully diabetic level that you want. Well, of course, no doctor would do that, but the point is this. We know how to make a person diabetic. We know exactly how to make someone diabetic. So if we know that, we can simply reverse the process and we'll have a way to turn a diabetic into a non-diabetic according to the numbers. We can tell them, for example, don't graze all day. Eat only two meals a day, perhaps the first meal at 12.30 p.m., the second at 5.30 p.m., and no snacks allowed ever. And then for their two meals, we'd tell them to eat low-carb foods like meat, salads, cheese, nuts, cream, low-carb veggies, and so forth. If you need a little something sweet, once in a while make a cake in a mug out of almond flour, coconut flour, and an egg with a little erythritol thrown in and put a couple of mashed strawberries on top. We could tell our patient with the A1C of 6.0, do this for four months and then have an A1C taken. And if that person still has a functioning pancreas, it is extremely likely that they'll go from being pre-diabetic to a level of totally non-diabetic by the end of four months. So, what causes diabetes? It is becoming apparent that the cause is continually and constantly eating high-sugar, high-carb foods, provoking constant and continual high insulin levels resulting in fatty pancreas, fatty liver, fat-filled and sugar-filled cells, and usually obesity. And simply by reversing our behavior, we can eat in such a way that we keep our insulin levels low and start slimming down our liver, our pancreas, our cells, and eventually even our body. Our numbers will drop and we will start feeling great. And chances are we'll hear our doctor saying something like, how in the world did you do this? And he may even say, whatever you're doing, just keep right on doing it. It is working.